Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, Assalatu Wassalam, Allah Rasulillah. Inna Alhamdulillah, Nahmaduhu, wa nasta'inuhu, wa nasta'afiru, wa nu'minu bihi, wa natawakkalu alayhi. Wa a'udhu billahi min shuroori anfusina, wa min sayyiyati amalina. Man yahdillahu falamudillala, wa man yudlil falahadiyala. Wa ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah wahdahu la sharika lah. Wa ashadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu. Honorable scholars, respected elders, dear brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum again. It is an honor to be uh, here uh, with you uh, to share this important topic. The topic of today's khutbah is the importance of giving da'wah. I like to call it da'wah is our lifeboat. And whoever embarks on it is inshallah safe. And I will explain to you why. I will cover it under three topics. Why is such a claim being made that da'wah is a lifeboat? Who and how can da'wah be given? And are we qualified in making, uh, giving da'wah? So the first topic is why? Why is it so important to give da'wah? Why is da'wah a lifeboat? And what are some of the, uh, the proofs we have from the Quran and from the life of Prophet Muhammad that this is such an important and very important topic? If we read Surah Al-Asr, which is a very short surah, but a very, very meaningful surah, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, after I've said, Audhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, wal-asr, inna al-insana fi khusr, illa al-ladhina amanu wa amilu s-salihati wa tawasaw bil-haqqi wa tawasaw bil-sabr. The translation of the meaning, because Quran cannot be translated, so the translation of the meaning is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is swearing by time. Allah says, I swear by time, verily mankind is at a loss. The entire human race is at a loss. Illa ladina amanu, except a certain group of people. And who are they? Illa ladina amanu, those who believe and they follow up that belief with righteous good deeds. So Allah says, except those who believe and they do righteous deeds. And Allah could have ended it there. Because the person believes and he does righteous deeds, is that sufficient? In order to be in that group that Allah is saying is not a loser, they actually take it to the next level. They are the ones, Allah says, they engaged in what the will help. They engaged in reminding each other of the truth. And by each other can be Muslims and also non-Muslims, our fellow brothers and sisters in humanity. We are engaged in reminding each other of the truth. And whoever has engaged in act that activity of reminding others of the truth will face criticism, will face obstacles, will face challenges. So Allah lets us know that they not only engage in reminding each other of the truth, but they also remind each other to be patient. Because reminding each other of the truth requires patience. It requires a lot of patience. Sometimes you may want results and you may not see it. Sometimes you may face criticism that you're not used to getting and you may not be patient enough to accept it in a nice way. So it does require a lot of patience, and the best ones is ourselves reminding each other that we need to be more patient. The next surah <coughs> is from Surah uh, Yusuf, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in ayah number eight, and uh, after I've said, Abu Bilal ibn Shaitan Rajim, Allah says, كل هذه سبيلي يدعو إلى الله على بصيرة أنا ومن اتبعت من اتبعني وسبحان الله وما أنا من المشركين. Say, O Muhammad, صلى الله عليه وسلم, this is my way. I invite unto Allah with sure knowledge. I 
and whosoever follows me. Exalted is Allah, and I am not of the mushrikeen. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is commanding Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that tell the people that I, meaning the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is inviting to Allah with sure and certain knowledge. And he mentions that those who claim to follow him are also engaged in that act by saying, I and whosoever follows me. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is no longer in this earth. The Sahaba are no longer on this earth. The Tabi'in and the Tabi Tabi'in, the greatest of the generations, are no longer in this earth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, out of his wisdom, chose each and every one of us to be in the place where we are. He sees potential in each one of us for the people we have been put next to, to call them to Islam using the talents and the life experiences that we have with beautiful manner and wisdom. And if we claim to follow Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then we have to engage in the calling that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was also engaged in. The last surah, uh, section of the surah I will mention to you as the importance of why we should engage in this act is from Surah Al-A'raf. Allah mentions a very beautiful story about the previous Muslim generations, before nations before us. Before I mention the story, I want to mention something important as well, that when we read about the previous Muslim nations, or the, the nations that Allah had mentioned certain stories about them, it's not so that we look down upon them or look up to them, but to extract valuable information that we can implement in our life. And Allah has chosen those stories because those are similar tests, or maybe difficult ones, we will be going through in our life, and that we can learn lots of lessons from it. So this particular story is talking about the Muslims of that time from the Bani Israel. And they were a particular tribe that was close to the ocean. It's a very beautiful and long story. I'll try to summarize it for you. And so the main profession was fishing. And so Allah wanted to test them. And he said, that the command came that you cannot fish on Saturday. So the fishermen, they knew that we are not allowed to fish on Saturday. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to test them even more, he sent fish in abandoned, abundant quantity on Saturday. Now imagine you're a fisher, fisherman, you're sitting next to the ocean, it's Saturday, fishes are just jumping in front of you, up and down, and you're like, I'm losing distance here, you know? And so, as many businessmen of our time, Muslims or non-Muslims, they started to think, so-called creatively. And what did they decide to do? They decided that they're going to not fish on Saturday, but they will plant the nets on Friday night. <clears throat> and the fishes will come, they'll get caught on Saturday on the nets, and they'll take the nets out on Sunday, hoping to deceive Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's commandments. But they deceive no one except themselves. And a righteous group of people from the children of Israel stood up for this. And they said, this is wrong. This is absolutely wrong. You're not allowed to do this. And this will bring Allah's punishment upon all of us. So, and you would have thought the story ended there. There were the good guys, there were the bad guys, and you know the, the whole thing. But interestingly enough, Allah mentions about a third category of people. And this category of people went up to the righteous group of people and started to talk to them and says, why you are bothering these people who Allah is going to punish and destroy them? What's the, what are you trying to accomplish here? You know, just leave them be. Why, why, why do you have to make such a noise? Just, you know, you think it make a difference? Guess what the people said, the righteous people? They said, said. They said, in order to be free from guilt before our Lord, Allah. And perhaps they may have taqwa of Allah. So they're saying, I'm not going and telling them that this is wrong because I'm expecting them to change their behavior overnight. No. It is so that I may have an excuse in front of my Creator on the Day of Judgment saying, Allah, I stood up for what is truth 
and I stood up for when somebody engaged in the wrong thing, in a nice way I tried to remind them. And who knows, perhaps from our reminder, some of them may become God conscious and they may stop that particular uh, thing that they were not supposed to be engaged in. So we too need to benefit from that story. Not so th that we expect results to come from our advocacy, but we expect to have excuses on the day of judgment for ourselves and maybe our remembrance uh, might help them in, in changing their ways. The next section we're going to cover is who should be giving da'wah. As I've already alluded to some of it in Surah Al-Asr, Allah says, those who believe and they do righteous deeds. And those are the ones who engaged in calling the people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now I understand it is may seem daunting to some people that I don't have a lot of knowledge. I may not be able to articulate Islam in a, a very creative way. So how can I do that? Which is understandable, but that doesn't give us an excuse not to engage in that process. Uh, I will, in the next chapter I will cover that on how you can engage in that process. But for those of us who would love to be engaged in this process and we have communication skills mastered, uh, or, or at least have good, good uh, communication at a work and other places, we should always engage in that. Anybody here who's been a Muslim for more than 20 years and doesn't know Surah Al-Ikhlas? I don't think so. We all know Surah Al-Ikhlas. And Surah Al-Ikhlas is one of the shortest surahs of Islam in, in Quran, and it is considered one third of the Quran. And it is so beautiful and so short that it is so easy for people to understand. If I'm engaged with somebody and I'm trying to make them understand who is God, what a beautiful thing then to recite his words. It's so easy. You can just say you know, to them that, listen, I will recite to you what God Almighty revealed to us. And you say it. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. And you translate it to them. In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. God is saying, say, God is one and uniquely one. Allah Samad, He is eternal and absolute, meaning He does not need anything and we are the ones who are in need. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. He begets not, nor is He begotten. Makes sense. He doesn't need the colors of His earth. He is free of that. He is not begotten, nor is He. Uh, uh, nor, 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 he does not begin, nor does he, nor is he begotten. And there is nothing unto the creation like unto him. There is nothing in the creation, in the heavens and the earth, in the oceans and the deep, deep below, nothing compares to him. So easy and so clear to understand for those who reflect. The last part of the khutbah I'm going to focus on is how to engage in giving da'wah. Da'wah can be to two kinds of people, to Muslims and non-Muslims. My part of the khutbah is going to focus on just on non-Muslims. And it starts with uh, preparing ourselves. But on, before that, it even starts with the most important thing, which is the intention. Why are we giving da'wah? The intention should be only for the sake of Allah, only for His pleasure, because then you will not be disappointed with the results that you may get or not get. N number two is to prepare. Prepare ourselves before we go out in the morning to our businesses. And the best way to prepare is to read or listen to the life of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was constantly, day and night, engaged in our activity. He was always prepared and he was always looking for opportunities to find ways to creatively call people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The next part is having a good manner. In order to engage in this act, it's very important for us to have a good manner. And it starts with something simple, a smile. Many of us uh, may be very used to smiling, but some of us may not be. 
but it's good to smile. That is one of the sunnah. And they say that is a saying that it takes more facial muscle to frown than to smile. So if you want to stop the aging process, it's better to smile more than to frown. And many times you may not have to say anything to anybody. If somebody is doing something wrong, there's a story of a man, he used to get angry with people in, you know, calling them to the truth. So he went to a scholar and he said, give me some advice. I always get too rough and tough with people when I'm telling them and it doesn't work out. He said, just smile. Just smile and leave it at that. He said, okay. So one day he saw a man smoking. So he smiled at him. Didn't say anything. The guy says, why are you smiling at me? I'm just smiling. He said, you think, uh, you want me to quit smoking, huh? He just kept smiling. And then next thing the topic opened up and eventually the man quit smiling. They quit good smoking, basically. So rather than looking down on people, start with a beautiful manner, uh, with, with simple things like a smile. And on top of that, to have a heart that is full of compassion and love towards the people we are calling to Islam. It is not appropriate for us to look down on a non-Muslim because who knows, at the last moment, Allah might like something in that person because of him, because of that act, he might guide him to Islam. And he may see something in my deeds that may be so bad that towards the end I may die as a non-Muslim. So what's important is to have a compassion and love towards the people that we're calling and not to look down on them. It's okay to hate the actions, but it's not okay to hate the people or to dislike them. Number three is use your creativity in calling people to Islam in creative ways. I'll give you two examples that I use in my own, own uh, personal life. One is, a, for example, an orchid. I love flowers, I love uh, animals, because they help me to appreciate Allah's creation. When you look at the art, you get to appreciate the artist. So one of my colleagues had a beautiful orchid at, uh, the, at the desk. So I naturally was drawn to it, and I was quite impressed by the flower. I said, can you mind if I borrow the flower from you? I'll bring it back. I just want to take a picture of it because I just like it. It's so beautiful. And the person said, go ahead. So I took a picture of it, and I, I sent the person a copy back. And naturally, the picture somehow came out better than what the flower actually looked. And the person said, you know, in an email back to me, said, I really appreciate you sending me this flower. It makes me appreciate it even more and how beautiful it is. I said, yes, I appreciate that too. But what's even more amazing is the one who created that flower. And so I left that person with a thought, thought process, and I wanted to see where that person goes with that. And eventually that conversation went into a deeper conversation, and I left it at that. Whether that person accepted Islam or not, it's not my business. But I brought Allah into the conversation in a creative way. The second example is I went to a dentist. I was having some teeth problems, and uh, some serious teeth problems. So this particular dentist, he was a very nice gentleman, and he showed an x-ray of my teeth. And I was really disappointed in what I saw. But more than that, I was quite disappointed that now he's going to have another reason to hate Muslims. <laughs> he's going to think these people are not only bad people, but they also have bad teeth. <laughs> and it really bothered me a lot. So I, I told him, I said, doctor, if you don't mind, I'd like to get something off my chest. He said, go ahead. I said, I want you to know there's a distinction between Islam and Muslims. He said, is that, is that the case? I said, yes. I said, Islam is a beautiful and perfect way of life. But Muslims, we are work in progress. So I don't want you to please associate Islam with my bad teeth, thinking that we don't take care of our teeth. Because you would be surprised to find out that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, who was in, born in the 6th century, was the greatest advocate of dental hygiene that would ever appear on the face of the earth. And I'm talking about 6th century, where people didn't even care much about the teeth not as much as they do now. He said, how so? I said, he used to clean his teeth more than six times a day. And the first thing he would do when you enter his house, he would clean his teeth before he would even kiss his wife. I said, this is the man who has brought this religion to us. And I want you to know, as his follower, I am really failing badly. But please don't associate this to him or to the religion that he was sent with. Eventually, after three or four visits, I left him with some brochures. And that was it. Uh, it's not my job what he does with it, what he plans to do with it. But at least I shared the message of Islam with it, because it is my duty 
to share this uh, uh, message with him. So think creatively. If you're a sales guy and you're in business of selling something, you're always looking for customers, right? You're always looking for opportunities. How can I get this customer? It, it's natural. So if you know this product, if you, for example, you're told that, okay, if you can sell one iPhone a day, you're gonna get $1 million com commission. And if you know the product, and you know people are using probably just uh, you know outdated land phones, and you're coming with them with, to them with iPhone, you got an easy sale. You're gonna say, look, you, you like to check your emails often? Yeah, okay. You like to uh, uh, call from anywhere you like rather than from your home? Yeah. Uh, well, do you like to have uh, coverage anywhere you go? Yes. Well, guess what? I got the perfect solution for you. It's called iPhone. You get one, and you're set. So you think creatively. We have the best product in Islam. If you are a Muslim, if you're in, in, in a good situation and you're thankful, it's good for you. If you're in hardship and you're p uh, patient, it's also good for you. And whatever you go through for the sake of Allah in life, it is a win-win situation for you. So think creatively and try to invite people with creativity that you come across at your daily situation, especially with your colleagues, because they get to see you. So make sure you get to interact with them in creative ways about Islam. So the next point I want to mention is sometimes we do a lot of good deeds, but we never remind people of the sponsor. You know, whenever you see Super Bowl commercials, you know, or other commercials, whenever somebody's show, giving you something, they always mention, this has been brought to you by this so-and-so sponsor. Why do I mention that? When you do a good deed, and somebody says, for example, you're a good neighbor, and you help somebody out, and your neighbor says, thank you so much, you really helped me a lot. I said, don't thank me, thank Islam. Really, why? Because Islam requires me to be good to you. So remind them about the sponsor. Remind who is it that actually encouraged you to do that act, uh, to do that a good act. What to talk about? Well, I mean, when you're engaged in this conversation, when you want to call somebody to Islam, how do you start the conversation? Well, you start talking about basic things. Let them know that you are a human being just like them who values similar things that you value. If you're a parent, talk to them about their children. If you are a colleague that is going through uh, a busy schedule, ask them how was their weekend. Simple things like that. Open up the conversation and ask them probing question. Ask them, do you believe there's a creator? If they say yes, well, then you know you don't have to worry about talking about proving there's a creator. If you know, if you ask them, do you believe that Jesus, is, peace be upon him, is a prophet? Some of them will be surprised. They'll say, yes, I do believe he's a prophet. Well, then you don't have to worry about proving to him Jesus is a prophet, peace be upon him. Then if you ask him, some of them will be surprised. Do you believe that he was the actual physical son of God? They'll say, no. Well, then you have even greater opportunity. Then you ask them a question like, have you heard about Islam? Some of them will be surprised. They'll say, yes, I have heard about Islam. Well, do you know much about Islam? They say, yes, I know a lot about Islam. And ask them, is there anything you dislike about Islam? You'll be surprised. Some of them, they'll tell you, no, I like Islam. Well, then if you like Islam, the next natural question, any say, car salesman will tell you, well, what can I do to get your business today? What is it that was preventing you from becoming a Muslim today? Some of them, they don't have a reason. They're probably waiting for you and me to go up to them and ask them, would you like to be a Muslim today? But you, go, you don't go and ask that as the first question. You have a normal conversation. You do some probing question. And then you engage the audience and engage in meaningful conversation. And try to pose that question. And you never know. If not anything, your job is done. Even if they don't accept the message, it's not our job. That is Allah's job to guide people to Islam, whoever He wills. Our job is to call people with beautiful manner and wisdom. I want to leave you with some resources uh, on how you can make things easy for you. Uh, there are beautiful websites where you can order brochures from. Uh, it's called whyislam.com slash bazaar. B-A-Z with a double A. B-A-Z double A-R, bazaar. It's for $8, you get 100 brochures. It, and you can choose whatever brochures you like. The best ones are concept of God, who is Jesus in Islam, uh, what is worship in Islam, and what is hijab in Islam. You can explain, if you don't have time to explain, you give them a small brochure and you leave it at that. 
If you feel it's too much of a burden for you to engage in this uh, conversation, then help us. Maybe buy some brochures for us and give it to us so we can distribute it for you. If you feel that you are overburdened by having this conversation, then at least be the one who doesn't do any harm. Make sure that whatever you're doing, your colleagues do not see that as a negative thing. Because if, don't, if they don't see at least anything good out of you, don't let them see anything bad out of you. Because that they will associate that to Islam. So we should, we should be mindful of that. Lastly, I would like to remind myself and others to be a source of peace and joy to others. You know, there's a saying that says, there are some people, <coughs> when they come, everybody's happy. And there are some people, when they leave, everybody's happy. So we want to be among those people that people are happy when we arrive. And not those among those, they're happy when we leave. Like one scholar, he said, you know, if you were to lose your cell phones uh, today, would you miss them? Sure. Why? Because the cell phone is so useful. I could make calls, I could check my emails, I could do many things with it. But if we, our colleagues were to lose us tomorrow, will they miss us? Will the, if our children were to miss, lose us tomorrow, will they miss us? If our neighbors were to lose us tomorrow, will they miss us? What are we doing to add value to their life? So just for those who dozed off and coming back, I want to summarize what the topic was about today. The topic of today was, Dawa is our lifeboat. Whoever embarks on it is inshallah safe. We talked about why is it important. We mentioned Surah Al-Hasr. Allah says, entire human race is at a loss except those who believe and do righteous deeds and they don't stop there. They engage in, in, in reminding each other of the truth and they remind each other to be patient. We talked about uh, Surah Al-Yusuf where the Prophet Muhammad mentioned that uh, he was commanded by Allah to call people to Allah him and those who follow him. And it is now our time that we are here. It is our responsibility to call people to Islam. And lastly, we talked about who should be engaged in Islam in calling people to Dawah and how uh, we should uh, try to engage in that act. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us and have mercy upon us Amen. and to forgive our Muslim relatives who have passed away Amen. and to have mercy upon those who are suffering and in, in poor health or in difficulty Amen. and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give victory to all those who are oppressed being in all parts of the world Amen. and we ask Allah to uh, forgive us uh, and make our best day our last day our best deed our last, uh, our last deed we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to increase us in beneficial knowledge, ilmun nafiyah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us uh, a wholesome uh, provision, rizqan khayyiban. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us deeds that are accepted, amalan mutaqabbala. Uh, and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send his blessings and mercy upon Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Amen. and upon all the righteous people who pass it before us. Amen. Wa salatu wa salam wa rasulillah wa akhir da'ala wa alhamdulillah rabbil alamin. Wa akhir wa salam. Sirat al-Ladina lam ta'am